Hi, John. How are you doing? Hi, good, good. How are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. You got some wine open? I do. I've been uh, working on these Northern Rhones. You know, Northern Rhone, I'm excited to talk about the Northern Rhone today. We have a pretty impressive selection of great names and uh, great terroirs. You know, I think um, when people think about, uh, you know, French wines, of course, there's the two iconic wines. There's Bordeaux, there's Burgundy. And uh, but if you had to pick it like a third region to put up there on that pedestal with the rest of them, I, I think it would be Northern Rhone, at least for me. Uh, how about yourself? I mean, it's definitely between Northern Rhone and Champagne, but in terms of the market right now, it certainly seems more favored to Northern Rhone than Champagne these days in terms of what people are buying, what people are talking about, and what perhaps has has more interest for the for for the consumer. Well, I guess Champagne. That's uh, that's like a curveball. I guess that is technically Sorry. fine, but uh, you know, you're right. Champagne is definitely uh, arguably up there, but. Uh, you know, for me, I think what's exciting about the Northern Rhone is the value you can get for some of these like world-class wines. Of course, there's Shab, there's Gigal, you know, there's the iconic wines, but beyond like those two producers and a few others from yesteryear, like Versailles and Gentas and, and some of these uber expensive wines because they're not being made anymore, there is a wealth of amazing wine from like amazing producers and I think we have four uh, really good ones, including, of course, one of the iconic uh, guys, Jean-Louis Chav, although this is uh, not a domain wine, technically. It's a, a Cote de Rhone uh, made from the region. It's his Negocian brand, which he started up about 20 years ago very quietly, and now he's kind of become, uh, you know, a very important Negocian as well as being probably the most uh, iconic and collectible wine in the Northern Rhone. And, and we have uh, his Cote de Rhone uh, to start. There's a few things before we get into the wines, we definitely want to uh, welcome um, everybody for joining us and thank you for being here. And we want to, if you want to participate or ask us a question online, you can send a direct message uh, to Lily and we can call you online and get you you know, participate if you want. You know, if, if you're uh, showing the video and want to ask your question live, we're happy to do that uh, as well. Or you can just ask a question uh, in the chat, you know, in the chat and uh, we'll answer it as we go along to keep this. We want to keep this uh, a two-way street and participate with all of you. Part of the beauty about sharing wine or drinking wine is sharing wine together. And this is not meant to be you know, a lecture as much as it's meant to be uh, everybody participating and enjoying. So I hope there are some people enjoying some of these wines or at least some Northern Rhones tonight, or maybe some Syrahs, you know, we, we hopefully have a, a mix of all of the above and curious to find out um, what everybody's drinking later on. But uh, for now, we're going to start with a good friend of mine, uh, Icon, really one of the great, great, great winemakers in the entire world, Jean-Louis Schaub. And tell us a little bit about this, uh, this wine, Lily, about the Nego story and, and what's going on with Jean-Louis in this. So Jean-Louis started when he, he came into the domain, I think in the late 80s, as the 16th generation of the family. They go back to the 1400s. Um, but the family home is really in Saint-Joseph. Um, and as they were, as he, when he joined the domain, was trying to kind of regrow the vines there and replant and kind of reinvigorate that region of the estate, he started buying fruit from San Joseph and from Cote and from different locations in the Cote Rhone, trying to kind of expand their portfolio and have other projects to work on. And the Cote Rhone came from that beginning, the first vintage of the San Joseph, which was how the selections project began, was 1995. And the Cote Rhone comes actually from more of the Southern Rhone. So it's all these appellations around chateauneuf du pop And it's a blend of Syrah and Grenache. The percentages were not precise, precisely available. And they're practicing organic. And the wine's pretty delicious, especially for the price. John, what are you thinking about it? We've, we've had it open. We teased it on Instagram a few hours ago. What do you think of it now? That's some air. I am enjoying it tremendously. I mean, this wine has been open for me now like three hours and uh, it's not, losing a step at all. I mean, you know, I think, I mean, it's, 
for 25 bucks a bottle to get a wine from a producer such as Jean-Louis Schaub. I mean, that's, that's almost more exciting than having like a great bottle of Catalan or something, which you know, yeah, okay, it's gonna be spectacular. And, but it's, you know, at $5,000 a bottle, okay, it better be spectacular. Here, you know, at, you know, for $25 a bottle to see, you know, his uh, craftsmanship, his, you know, style of winemaking and, and, and to be able to touch, you know, uh, his uh, producing style and skills is, is amazing. I mean, there's not, I don't think there's that many producers on his level where he can buy a wine that's 25 bucks a bottle and kind of feel this excited about it. Um, I, I think it's, and I also, we've had it open for a while, but both of us, and I think it's really improved with a lot of air. And I think that speaks to the fact that even lesser wines from great producers and even kind of more kind of, I, I don't even know how to term this, but wines that don't have such a high price tag aren't from the most famous regions certainly like really can benefit from having a lot of air. Oxygen is really a wine's friend. And how much oxygen do you tend to like for your wine or tend to like personally in general? I personally like a lot of oxygen, especially these days. Um, but uh, I, for younger wines, I open them usually three hours in advance. I don't know. Three hours, right. So even um, any region, any, Anyone, I'll, I'll hedge it and say primarily for red wines. And you can actually keep your hands off the bottle for three hours? Yeah, I'm very measured as a person, John. You have like another bottle like open from the night before to like hold you over for those three hours? I that's... may have a bottle of Riesling open that I had dinner with. Right, right. Because I'm not, I'm not a patient man when, it, when, you know, that's the one thing like when I you know, if I open the wine, I'm like, oh, let me taste it. Let me see how it's doing. And then I'm like, oh, well, hey, it's kind of good. And then I'm like, I'm already, it's a slippery slope for me, you know, so. But I'm much happier that. revisiting this wine at 8 p.m. than I enjoy, than how I felt about it at 5. It's, I think, the, what illustrates the point the best. I right. like wine much better three hours later. And you were saying earlier that you felt that this wine, even though it's a Syrah-based wine, that this had a little more Grenache maybe than... Uh, it, Beautiful for Jean Louis. The his Cote de Rhone always has a fair bit of Grenache in it, and to me, this reads a little bit more Grenache, if you will. Mm -hmm. We got a question that 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 kind of speaks to what we're talking about right now. Someone asked thoughts on decanting with new versus older wines, and I think John and I might disagree on this point. Why? How do I? I would never disagree with you. How do I disagree with you? No, on dis, on decanting older wines. Oh, older wines? What, what is your thoughts before I can say if I disagree or not? Well, I, depending on how far back we're going, I always like a little, whether we're going to do a double decant for service, as I do for events and things like that, I just like getting wines off their sediments, primarily just for ease of drinking them. I find right. it a lot easier to deal with wines. And also, if the wine is good, oxygen isn't necessarily going to hurt it. From right. my, my experience with working with older wines, like, if the wine is good, oxygen isn't going to necessarily hurt it. If the wine isn't good, that's where you're going to run into a problem. Well, double decanting, I mean, that's like a quick cold shower, like just wake it up and then like it's going back in. It's getting yeah. put the clothes back on right away and it's in the bottle and it's not, you know, exposed. It's like different when you put it in the decanter and leave it in the decanter, right? I mean, that's a lot more oxygen being exposed to the wine. So, you know, so compare what, what would you consider old versus new? To me, I'm starting to think of old wines beginning, I want to say now at this point, like 30 years old. Right, like 82-ish is kind of... Uh, no, that's, John, that's farther back than that. And my math is not so good. No, your, your, your math is usually really strong, but tonight, um, I would say somewhere around 1990, 90, like, but I, I, like I would give a 95 Red Bordeaux a lot of air, I'd give a 90 less air. But certain regions would get more air, like like Bordeaux or Northern Rhone, like these Syrahs maybe, than say an older Burgundy you might. This, uh, is that your dog right there? That was my dog, yes. Okay, well, you know. did you feed him tonight or is he okay? Yeah, he, he, he ate his Northern Rhone steak. Okay, so good. He's doing well. 
think he's eating better than me, actually. So, you know, you had tofu, which I think was the wrong call for the wines we're having this evening. I did have some tofu tonight, uh, but it was excellent tofu, and uh, I'm okay. I can, I, you know, I'm okay to say that I eat tofu in public here. It's okay. Tofu is okay. You don't have no to shame. be ashamed about eating tofu. You know. Um, where would you like? Where would you cut put the threshold for how much air you're going to give your wines? Like, let in for the example of like a coat roti or a cornas. Um, how much air would you give? I mean, I think a general rule of thumb that a uh, very famous uh, collector and mentor of mine named Bippin Desai, who's a uh, physics professor uh, in Los Angeles, and Bippin held some of the greatest wine tastings of all time, many of which I was fortunate to go to starting in the late 90s, early 2000s. You know, uh, I traveled with him to Bordeaux uh, many times. He kind of took me under his wing and I'm very grateful for him. He's, now he's in his mid 80s and he's, he's still uh, going to an event or two, but he's not, uh, you know, hosting these grand events like he used to, which winemakers would come for the weekend and he would do a Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday thing and these giant retrospectives. And, you know, he always, told me and thought that in general, if you want to apply a blanket rule to like drinking wines or, you know, or you should always decant it 30 minutes before you're going to serve it. And then people can work it out in the glass. If you had to put one, you know, blanket rule on everything. So, you know, because sometimes you can't sit there and monitor, especially when you're doing a tasting of like 30 different wines and, and you know, you can't really monitor every single wine, which one is that? So that was his kind of rule of thumb, which I think is a safe rule, but certainly when you get into younger wines, you know, the more air, you know, the better. And, and like all these wines, you know, can benefit from hours and hours. And that's why I often like to cork up some wines and have a little bit the next day because you almost see that kind of natural evolution over time um, when you don't finish every bottle, you don't have to throw it all away or kind of get rid of it and you can kind of see it evolve. What are your thoughts on decanting something much older then? You know, I think decanting much older, it, it's, it's pop and, and serve. You're decanting it, like you said, to get rid of the sediment, to get kind of get it clean so nobody gets any, uh, you know, chunky stuff in their teeth and, uh, you know, has that awful wine smile that some, we, we all know very well, you know. Uh, so it, that's to get rid of the, uh, the sediment, you know, but uh, I, I think that, you know, the, the, the oldest wines, I have no problem with canning them, but, you know, just serve right away. And if it's super old and super rare, super geeky, like it's 1906 or something, you know, or, or crazy weird vintage that's not like a, a Bordeaux or some obscure wine, I, I don't think, you know, decanting is always necessary. That just goes to more of the point of stand, stand the wine up so that the sediment falls to the bottom of the bottle over the course of a week or so, and then right. pull the cork and pour very carefully. That's right. the best way to treat something very old, but we're not drinking anything like that here. Yeah, these are some young bucks, and the shop is, of course, a delicious wine, great value, 25 bucks a bottle. You should um, definitely enjoy that uh, at home all the time. Very recommended. So um, what about this next wine, Fauré, huh? Tell us a little bit about uh, Mr. Fauré. Lionel Fauré, so the Dumoulin, started in 1979. The Colleen, so it's on the label, it's labeled as Syrah Colleen Rodanien, and it's 100% Syrah. Colleen Rodanien is this lesser kind of catch-all appellation in the Northern Rhone that covers all of the declassified, undesignated grapes from the surrounding regions of the major players. So your Cote Roti, your Cornos, your San Josef, your Hermitage and your Crows Hermitage. It's kind of the surrounding appellations that if your vines, you don't find your vines to be old enough and things like that, you declassify into this category and you can still make something that's absolutely delicious. And a lot of the great names in the Northern Rhone make Colleen Rodanien, um, as their kind of entry level wine. So Jamais makes one, Fauré makes one, a couple other people do as well. And they're really delicious wines. So Fauré has been in the Kermit Lynch, like a staple of the Kermit Lynch profile for a very long time. Uh, and they partially destem and they do pigeage or the punch down, like punching down the cap with their feet. So it's a very traditional winery. 
Uh, and I, I find this wine to be really delicious on the lighter side, a little bit lighter than the Shav, I thought. What do you think, John? I, I mean, this is a real revelation for me on, on many levels. I mean, first of all, I, you know, I never even heard of this region, you know, myself. It hasn't gotten on my radar, you know, in auction world or like, you know, this kind of stuff. And I mean, Fauré is actually kind of uh, a, a new name for me as well that I wasn't quite that familiar with. And um, he's from St. Joseph. He's really a St. Joseph guy as, you know, is the Shaw family. And I mean, this wine, first of all, it's only 12% alcohol compared to the Shab, which is, you know, closer to 15. And I mean, to have a wine, a Syrah from Northern Rome, that's 12% alcohol is like, I mean, I, now you're like talking my language here. I mean, this is like, you know, a beautiful, beautiful wine. This is just so easy to drink. And, uh, you know, it's, it's got, we're all drinking Syrahs. These are all Syrah based wines, right? I, I saw a, a comment about or a question about what, what grapes we are. This is all Syrahs from the Northern Rhone region, you know, which is very different from the Southern Rhone and Chadmif de Pop. Um, you know, so um, this Syrah, I mean, this is a fantastic wine. So this region is kind of a region, if I understand correctly from our conversations today is kind of like this region where producers go to make a wine where they don't have to deal with the AOC or like leave us alone we want to do our own thing which it's like it's like northern Rhone like free and wild you know uh doing whatever what they want and I mean this wine's fantastic it's not expensive either how much is it uh, I think this is 24.99 so same same price as a shot I mean, this is like of a dollar Right, right. This is like a run, don't walk, uh, get it wine. Yeah, twenty four ninety nine, and yeah. they make the their winery. I think they make six or six different wines, cuvées, however you want to call them, between Colin Rodenien and IGP, two Saint Josephs. I think they may make a Blanc as well, which I want to talk to you about as we progress in the conversation. They make six thousand around sixty five hundred cases a year. Right, this is the uh, Fauré wine, the Syrah, the, by Kermit Lynch. I mean, Kermit Lynch, I don't know if I, my lighting's so good here. I can, I can change my lighting a little bit here. I don't think it'll show, it doesn't matter, right? Okay, yeah. I, I put it in the chat. Right, you'll put it in the chat, thank you, there, there. You can type and talk at the same time. You have more skills than myself, and uh, that's why you're a host in here. And what are you tasting with these, uh, with this wine here, I'm curious to, get, to know about like what kind of flavors, what kind of aromas, what are you getting out of the Syrah? You find this typical Syrah, you find this atypical Syrah, what, what are you getting? I find this very typical Syrah in a kind of whole cluster, a little, like has a touch of that kind of bubble gum thing that you almost see in Gamay sometimes from a little bit of carbonic maceration. I didn't read that they do any carbonic maceration where you get that sort of, sorry to get a little sciency. I know John, John likes to veer away from the science sometimes, but. That's, no, that's bubblegum banana scientist. sort of thing. You can be uh, the scientist, I'll be the capitalist. It's okay. We yeah, that's good. Cool. Well together, you know. Um, but I get that sort of like high toned plummy fruit along with a little bit of that candy bubblegummy thing to it. And the, a lot, so what's very significant about the Northern Rona is those granite soils that you see a lot of places. And this certainly has a, a, a fair hint of minerality. Mm, very nice tasting. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of minerality. There's a lot of kind of very rich, you know, a lot of that kind of mineral ceramic intensity on the um, on the finish, those kind of flavors. I mean, this delivers a mouthful of wine, but the, the, the fruit is very, I mean, you still get a little bit of that kind of the classic violet, the classic bacon, but not like just hints of it, not like over the top, not like, you know, very distinctive like co-roti or anything like that but there's kind of that kind of classic Syrah to it as well. And it's to me this has a great lightness and levity to it that people don't often associate with Syrah. I think people think of Syrah as this like heavy serious wine that needs like a fatty rich meat dish to go with it and to me this has such kind of transparency to it that I think makes it a little bit more versatile in terms of food pairing. Ooh, someone said they're they're getting some pomegranate, which I also agree with. Yeah, I definitely could see that. I see that for sure. A little pomegranate, almost like maybe a 
into cranberry, although there's probably a little more cranberry in the shav yeah. compared to this, right? The cranberry, which is getting sweeter and sweeter, you know, is in, in, in the glass, you know, a lot of these wines, you know, also the glass can be your de best decanter, kind of going back to like what we were talking about before, you know, working it, swirling it, airing it out. That's almost like the more you do that, the more you oxygenate, oxygenate, is that a word? That the Ox ox Oxygenate. O oxygenate. There you go. Oxygenate, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. We're going to oxygenate the wine here. And I mean, it, it actually makes a difference. That's, that's the, the ultimate decanter is your wine glass. You know, if you feel like the wine is too tight or too not ready, just keep working it, working it, let it sit in the glass, let it open up. You know, don't forget about it. Uh, too long, obviously, because sometimes wines can have too much oxygen, especially when they get older. But um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of uh, going back to that. And somebody, Stan said, had a good comment, Kermit Lynch, fantastic high uh, QPR, you know, for the portfolio, 100%. Like, there's a few importers in this country that, you know, you see their name on a wine and you know it's going to be good. Kermit Lynch is one of them. I think Grand Cru Selections is another. Skernick Wines is another really high quality hit ratio martine you know martine's wines we had her on last week those are a few of my favorites that absolutely have like fantastic wines and certain imports you see and you know hey just try it just go for it because they, they know what they're doing and kermit's definitely one of them the back label is just as important as the front i think is something that people don't realize and that's something that you can learn a lot that way if you're looking for certain importers just by turning the bottle around you can learn a lot that way just saying like, I'm gonna drink from this person's portfolio. They're known to have reliable wines across the board and you, you approach wine that way, that way versus, oh, look at the pretty label. Yeah, well these, you know, this, this, this and this, uh, you know, has a good importer and a pretty label. I like it, the little barrels in the cellar there. It's kind of uh, nice, very old school, you know, kind of, you know, I mean, I was, I was in the St. Joseph a couple times uh, last year, but only visiting Shab, you know, because we have a very special relationship with him and we do a lot with him. But, um, you know, some of these uh, and I actually I did visit Gano, who's another guy in St. Joseph. And, you know, you go down there and it's literally like this tiny room and all the barrels are packed in there. And it's like barely any light. You know, they have to like, you know, they can't barely, you know, barely see. And the, these really are like, you know, true artisans, like people that. And I think all these producers are kind of the same way. I mean, Shab has become, I mean, he, he built some new cellars that are now magnificent. He still has the old cellars, you know, and the new cellars. And it's kind of, uh, you know, he's kind of um, become, uh, you know, uh, grown to a different level. But most of these people on the road, they're just kind of going in their garage, their backyard, downstairs into their basement, and that's it. And, uh, you know, real artisans, real handcrafted wines, and I think we're we're seeing that, especially in in Fori, who's a, a guy I want to I want to try more of his wines actually after this one. Well, I'm I'm glad I I picked the wines for this one. I'll take the credit for it. So you were I think you were a little spe skeptical of this one, and I'm glad I could. Uh, well, I, up. I wasn't familiar with it. I was exactly. Skeptical, but uh, I hope you bought everything they had because uh, this is a, a good wine that people should. See if we can get you some more. Decking out for sure, you know, so, um, and, and we have um, the next two wines I haven't uh, had. I mean, we have some other questions maybe you want to check in on. Uh, um, okay, this is an interesting question related to taste, like the physiognomy perhaps of tasting wine. Um, someone asks, I'd be curious to know what are common ways to describe flavor? How do you associate a wine with a specific fruit or bubble gum? Some, this person is new to, to wine tasting, so okay. she's just trying to understand. So you're, you're someone that's very much known for your tasting notes. Um, how have you kind of grown, I think this is something that we touched on a little bit a few weeks ago with Aldo, in terms of growing that kind of bank of flavors for you to reach to when you're describing a wine? That's a great book. Um, uh, you know, Isabel, you should, you should buy Wine Simple from Aldo Soma, who's the wine director of uh, Bernadette and a great connoisseur, great friend. And he's made this book. And I think, you know, you kind of look at uh, wine as like a flavor wheel, right? And like one, I think one quarter of those flavors are fruits. Like 
first, what's the fruit? What kind of fruit are you getting? There's black, well, let's talk red wine here. There's black fruits, there's red fruits, there's purple fruits, there's blue fruits. You know, what kind of fruits are you leaning towards? You know, are you leaning towards black? Are you leaning towards like cassis and blackberry and dark fruits? Are you, are you feeling more of the raspberry, the strawberry, the cherry, you know, which, which kind of merges in between black and red? Are you feeling, you know, some exotic things like cranberry or pomegranate? you know, and, and, and purple, you get into like boysenberry and cassis can kind of run the gambit of the spectrum of colors, you know, so there's like the fruit kind of side of things. And, and then there's what I would call, you know, like the, the earth, you know, side of things. There's the earth, the forest, the minerals, the grass, you know, the kind of nature aspects, the outdoor aromas that can often like find themselves you know, in wine, you know, and like the mushrooms and, and the subway and the hot stone and the granite and these kind of, all these kind of things are another, uh, you know, big component, you know, of, uh, of tasting. And there's, you know, it's really, there's no wrong answers. It's kind of like, you know, what are you feeling? What are you, you know, envisioning? And I like to taste wine often through like, you know, analogies or metaphors or similes, like I'm feeling like this, this wine makes me feel like that. And it has nothing to do with the flavor. It has to do with an emotion. I think a lot of wine is very emotional, you know, which, what, which is what makes it such a special thing to drink and to enjoy. It's like this emotional experience just that, that you have that can bring you back to a place or a sensation or remind you of a person or a thing. So there's this kind of emotional element I, I think that that there is, but definitely the fruit and the finish kind of are the two components, the earth and the fruit, I think are the major two components. And, and you know, then you get into like body weight, structure, tan and acidity, these kind of things. And what are some of the other things that, that you feel when, when you taste wine, Lily? Uh, I mean, I grew up very much looking at that Anne Noble flavor wheel chart. I have had it on a shirt that I've worn since I was a very small child. So Ann Noble was a professor of enology at UC Davis, which is the kind of preeminent school of winemaking in the US. Um, and she developed something that I think, that I suggest to all of my friends who are getting into wine that has all these different uh, fruits on them, uh, fruits, and then they're kind of categorized as inorganic, organic compounds that you kind of experience. And personally, like I've in my career done a lot of blind tasting and tried to be a very good blind taster. And something that uh, a master sommelier once recommended to me is to, to go to a grocery store, which is less easy to do now. So I apologize for suggesting this, but you go to a grocery store and you just smell stuff, which is weird. People will look at you funny, but it's very helpful to like say, okay, this is what raspberries smell like. This is what celery smells like because most of the time like we know what all these things taste like but we don't think about what they smell like and they're often found in wines the vegetables vegetables is another Im important component that's probably like the third i think you know quarter like you know the third quarter all there's the there's green vegetables there's you know the mushrooms which i said before it kind of blends into that forest and earthy stuff but there's a lot of vegetables you can get tomatoes and flowers too you know, you put flowers and vegetables into the thing that, you know, like acacia or honeysuckle or, you know, all types of vegetables, you know, you can find wine. Vegetables don't have to be a negative thing. Like everybody, you know, say, oh, it's, it's got some greenness. Greenness can sometimes be a good thing. It can sometimes be a bad thing, you know, and then there's like a lot of those sweet, you know, sweet things like honey, molasses, ginger, you know. Uh, Arab. Carob, I definitely use that. <laughs> Chocolate is a big one. Chocolate's in a lot of wines for sure, right? Like, so, you know, that's like, a, I think a, a, a quick, uh, we're probably forgetting uh, an important category or two, but that's, uh, and, and, chemical, and- Chemical aromas. So then you get into kind of your wine flaw stuff, um, which you can get from like cork taint, so TCA, and that can smell like wet cardboard or gym socks and things like that, or you can get right, stuff that's like- The barnyard, the animal. Red, an which is uh, yeah. the barnyard and the animals, or you can get uh, volatile acidity, which is the band-aid and the kind of 
rubbing alcohol, weird smells. There, there's a whole range of things. Someone actually put a link to the aroma wheel in the chat, which I think is great. Someone also mentioned spices. We haven't talked about spices. Right. Spices for sure, leather, right? Like there's, you know, but these are, you know, I think that was a pretty like quick spin around the wheel that uh, I don't think, I hope we didn't miss too much, but thanks to spices from Steven, absolutely. Leather, you know, peppery, you know, mines can be salty, they can be peppery and you can get the whole, you know, cinnamon, crazy animal meats, of course. Yeah, smoked meats for sure. I get mesquite a lot in wines. I get, you know, mesquite is something that I get in Syrah actually. Yeah. kind of often and I, I think it, that might be All of a bit in the uh the next wine that we're going to taste here right the uh the, the corn so we're going to move on to wine number three i'm going to launch a quick poll now that we're kind of getting into the into the upper echelons of the wines we're tasting about oh. people's favorite producers um in the rhone and so this is wine number three it's the uh 2018 vincent perry Cornas Granite 30. And I'll just give a quick precy on why they're called granite. He has two different cuvées of Cornas. Um, and the 30 refers to the incline of the slope that the wine is grown on. So a 30 degree slope versus a 60 degree slope. So the wines have to... How's your geometry, John? 30 degrees, is that a pretty good 30 degrees? I think so. Right. And then 60 is more up here. Yeah. yeah. So it has to do with how much the vines have to struggle or suffer to get to water and what the exposure is to the sun. Um, Vincent Perry is the nephew of one of the more esteemed historic producers in Cornos, Robert Michel, uh, was his uncle. And Vincent Perry is kind of a rising star, I would say, in Cornos. What do you think of this wine, John? I like it. I mean, this is a much deeper, uh, more concentrated wine. I think it's not as giving and ready. I mean, you know, I mean, that's kind of that, that, you know, we, we often put that under, oh, it's more serious because it's a little shut down or, you know, not so open or giving. But I think this is, you know, it, it definitely has some deep concentration, but it's a little shy compared to the other two wines, which are just so ready to go and so drinkable. You know, at that price point, I find a little, you know, heavier and 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 richer, a little darker. I'm getting more of the purple and the black kind of qualities without the red. And um, what do you? How are you feeling about it? I feel very similar. I think this is starting to have those more signature Northern Rhone. I get that kind of smoked meat quality and a little bit of the the olives as well. Those are the kind of I would say the signature profile. Kind of for Northern Rhone Syrah is the violets, the bacon, the olives. Anything else you want to throw in there? Right, and then of course the the animal, you know, the the the, the stones, the minerality, the animal that's so biased, that kind of wild, those wild herbs and stuff like that, right? And um, you know, I think Cornas is kind of really 10 years ago, I mean, nobody even talked about the wine, right? And, the, and now it's become this really sensation in, in the market. And I mean, now there are Cornasses that sell for over a thousand a bottle, really only one, per se, uh, but Clap, you know, he's, he's no longer making the wines. I mean, but I've had a, only two or three of his wines. They've been like incredible, as good as anything in the Rhone I've ever had. And, you know, Clap, of course, uh, uh, you know, the, the old man died uh, within the last year, unfortunately. But, you know, he was one of these, you know, guys who's been doing it for 80 years. And, I mean, Cornas is now kind of, it became like a, a little bit of an it thing, you know, for the Northern Rhone, right? It became like this, one of these, quote unquote, like Psalm wines that all the Psalms were like, oh, Cornas. But the Psalms know what they're talking about because they drink a lot of wine every day. And, you um, you know, I think, you know, some of the top producers have gotten more expensive, but I think the ones we have here are kind of at the, they haven't exploded to hundreds of dollars a bottle, but are still two great names. One a little more modern, one maybe a little more classic uh, when we're comparing the two, perhaps. You Which one do you find more modern? Well, I haven't had the other one, but I think Par Paris is um, a, was that a good, French pronunciation. Parfait. Right. Uh, you know, uh, Paris is definitely, um, 
I mean, for me, I think he's he's a little more uh, of a modern guy than uh, than others. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm trying to see if I. I don't know if he how much new oak he uses, but I can find out. I know that. Well, I don't want to say modern being you know new oak. Oak related. It's just more concentrated, like a more, you know, it's like it's very fruit driven as well, and and, he, and so. It's not that austere old school, like kind of like, oh, you know. What he does do is he prunes very heavily to get a lot more concentration on the vines themselves. So he prunes down to four bunches per vine versus kind of the norm, which is five to seven for Syrah. So you're getting a lot more concentration just from the vines themselves, which I think definitely shows in wine. And there's a, th a thousand cases only of this wine made a year thousand cases of, of the 30 so the 60 must be even rarer I guess right. right um someone asked kind of a question that I we've somewhat touched on but John do you think you can drink Cornas young I think it needs more time than um I think it needs age you can drink it young I mean this is an enjoyable wine. I feel like this wine the Perry wine is a little too young by my personal taste like the Fori and the Shav wines which are obviously lesser appellations or more kind of wines meant to be drunk young like you know no question about it delicious enjoyable happy drink of this one i feel like okay it's interesting it's a serious wine you know but yeah it's a little too soon for it so i think cornas probably definitely can benefit from you know probably 10 years i mean you know this feet to me feels like it's a wine that could use 10 years to kind of get into its uh Really? own skin and 45 bucks though you know i don't feel bad about drinking it now it's pretty delicious i thought this was more expensive honestly but by the taste of it you know it tasted i thought this was like a 70 or 80 dollar wine actually um i got a question privately about what are your opinions or how, how do you feel that french syrah drinks in comparison with australian shiraz yeah I do like Australian wines. I think the problem with Australia is the navigation uh, there. And I think what happened uh, in Australia 20 years ago, you know, Parker came out with this huge thing. And, you know, back then, 20 years ago, the, you know, wine critics, wine reviews, like, would just, you know, this was when the internet was just starting, really. I mean, I remember, like, you know, the first two years that email was like, available i was like now email i don't need email like forget email like no i'm not going to use it no it took me like actually a couple of years you know and that was in the late 90s you know and, and so it used to be the press and the critics the wine spectator parker you know a couple but parker really moved the market and he discovered all these australian wines and the wines just like tripled overnight in price and there was this huge speculation on these wines and then you know a lot of people started drinking these wines and like wow they're so alcoholic they're huge they're like, i don't know if i like them you know and it kind of it kind of skewed the whole perspective for for the region there are some amazing wines made in australia we had one monday uh, night actually which was a delicious wine not an alcoholic crazy wine actual the Suset, uh you know from two great uh wine people uh you know, Richard Betts and his wife, and, and they're making, you know, 800 cases of that wine down there. It's almost like a little mini Rias without, you know, the, the, the huge aging potential, which is just delicious. And, you know, Penfolds makes amazing wines. Henschke makes amazing wines. And, and there are a lot of other producers that are making amazing wines. Without question, you get more sweetness out of Australia. There is more of a jamminess. There is more of, like, this concentrated, like, spoonful of sugar, you know, to help the medicine go down quality with Australian wines that some people may not like. I like it if it's in the right hands. And I think Australia is really a region that is due for a renaissance. You just kind of have to find the right ones and maybe I got to go spend a month down there uh, and, and navigate a little bit again, because uh, I do like Australian wines. I just don't, you know, for me, I don't want those heavy wines that are like knock you out alcoholic blockbusters. And I think that's kind of where everything went and, and, and it kind of the whole region just like
kind of imploded accordingly. In, I also think they months. experiment a lot down. They, they very quickly experiment there, which I don't think producers in America or in France and most of Europe do very much. They're more, they wait for the slow evolution. They kind of slow roll their winemaking to be sure that they're not going to really screw something up. Whereas in Australia, they're really gung ho about changing everything each vintage. Yeah, they definitely, um, you know, have, uh, I think, the ability to kind of to do that. There's not as, as uh, you know, I think the whole world spotlight is not on them like it is in, in, in France or California, you know, Italy to a lesser extent. I mean, tends to have like, you know, real attention. So everything they do, you know, they, they, they have to really be aware of what they're doing and, and, and down there they can just kind of, and I think a lot, you're seeing a lot of old world producers doing things in the new world. Like we saw, you know, Jean-Marc Rouleau, who we're going to have Friday, which is going to be very exciting. For those of you who don't know, 12.30 PM Friday, uh, this Friday, we're going to have a, a Zoom session with Jean-Marc Rouleau, who I think is probably arguably the greatest producer of white wine in the world. I'm not, uh, I feel confident saying that and drinking his wines uh, relentlessly. And, and he's making a wine in Argentina, you know, just so they started making a couple, and it's a delicious wine. In other words, the Chakra wine costs 40 bucks a bottle, 45 bucks a bottle, whatever it is. And there you have, you can get this kind of thing in the new world. You're not going to get that same quality for 45 bucks in Burgundy that you actually get in, in uh, Argentina with the same hands making the wine. So there's a lot of potential in the new world, you know, for sure. And I think it kind of gets taken for granted by, you know, by the market a little bit, but um, for drinking, for pleasure, for, for enjoyment, uh, you know, th there's a lot of exciting things going on. Should we, I have two questions, but I think they're best to add on at the end. Um, okay. Do you want to move on to the fourth wine? I can do that. Okay, so the fourth wine that we're hitting on now is the uh, 2017 Alain Vosges, who's one of the, he's kind of one of the people that brought Cornas onto the international wine scene. He took over as his family's domain in 1965 when he was 26. And this is from 60 year old vine. it's the vines, it's their Vie Vigna. And in 2017, which was kind of a, a hot vintage because there was some drought. Um, they all of their vineyard designated cornas went into the Via Vigna Cuvée, so it's a little bit extra special compared to normal vi regular vintages. And the vines are about sixty years old, um, and it's pretty, uh, very much a classic cornas. What do you think? That's a mouthful of wine right there. That's like. Uh... It, it's a big one. I actually have the 2016 there. Ah, know. okay. For disclosure, not that I, I'm not tasting the same wine as you, unfortunately. But, you know, this, um, I mean, this is to me, I mean, first of all, I, I get I get a waff of like oak initially out of the wine. It's got, uh, it's 100% Syrah grapes, right? But Cornas it's, is always 100% Syrah. That's one thing about Syrah and a question we'll get to in a minute. It's, uh, Okay, we've lost Lily, but hopefully she'll come. I'm, I'm pouring, I'm refreshing. You're I refreshing. To refresh. I had to refresh, sorry. It's got, it's, this has got a lot of oak to it, honestly, you know, which is okay for a young wine, needs time to integrate. I mean, this is, you can taste it, the heaviness, the thickness, the, the, the grip in the mouth. I mean, it's not exactly what I would call a pleasure giving wine, uh, you know, immediately in, in, in its youth like this. How's the 17? What do you think about that? The 17, I would, I think you still get a lot of oak on it. I will say they don't use that. It's 15% new oak on these wines. Wow. Interesting. So it's, it's really minimal. I think it's more has to do with the concentration from the grapes themselves. This um, is the wine I think I would have liked to open up like yesterday. Yeah, in the morning or something. I'm going to cork this up and kind of get to know it over the next three or four days because I feel like it easily has that kind of like, you know, uh, span in the bottle, in, in the refrigerator, you know, take it out, taste it. And, and so that's something that everybody should realize, you know, 
when you're 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 drinking a wine, someone oh, it's so young, it's tight, and it's not ready, and not like enjoying it so much. Hey, put the cork back in, put it in the fridge, wait a day, you know, or or and, and go back to it, open something else, you know, like you don't have just because you open something doesn't mean you necessarily have to like drink it right then and there. And I think this is like the perfect example of why, okay, serious. I mean, it's clearly has the most concentration. I mean, it's the heaviest, richest wine by far, you know, of, of the four. And obviously VA Vine, you know, which gives more concentrated fruit and, and such. But, you know, honestly, this wine is like, it's a little too much for, for me, like, you know, to, to like, to process, even though it's probably the most expensive wine here, right? I, I assume. Yes, it is. This one is um, $79.99. Right, $79.99. And I think, you know, the, the more, you know, the more, I mean, I just poured it, so I didn't even like, this is the one I should have decanted. Yeah. But um, that wasn't, uh, you know, well, whatever. It wasn't in the instruction manual? I wasn't, I, I didn't, you didn't give me the instructions, Lily, and I am like, you know. I thought, no, I thought, I thought for you that one would have been implied but I guess not. But I can see as I'm working it, the, you know, the more I work it, this is a wine, you know, I mean, it needs like 10, 15 minutes. I'll be like, okay, now it's starting to get like, now it's starting to get somewhere. Like, you know, it's, it's tough to pour. The perfect example about a, you know, decanting wine, you know, a serious wine that you just, you can't pour it and just drink it right away, which I mean, even though I opened it at five o'clock and I left it open, I didn't decant it, you know, I didn't like, you know, uh, do the whole nine on it and as soon as I first pour I'm like whoa but you know if I sit here and keep working it working it working it you know this is like one of those this is the kind of wine you could take to the gym you know you got to just work it and keep working it and you know you you get something out. exercises with his wines clearly which actually I have too because I don't have weights in my home and now that we're all stuck at home I've started using wine as hand weights which is embarrassing but true that's um, not a bad idea. Yeah, if you use young white wine, it doesn't feel like a crime. Do you tape, do you tape the bottles around your wrists and ankles to get? We're that? not there yet, but I will say this morning I did hit myself with a bottle bracelet because the the long bottles are a little unwieldy. Um, I personally don't. I get a lot of oak on this wine, but maybe it's the vintage variation that John and I are experiencing. But I think this is drinkable enough for its youth. Yeah, the more, the more, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be unfair, but like, you know, that first sip is that the more I have it, it's kind of getting there. Both these wines, these, these two Cornas are very like, you know, they're rich, they're concentrated. I mean, they're impressive wines that, you know, uh, definitely could of, you know, having them decanted a little more and open a little more, you know, would have probably been the best move, but, uh, you know, didn't happen, but we so can we still- got two questions sent to us via email um, earlier today. And one of them is about uh, blending white wine into some of these appellations and the, the reasoning for doing so. Do you, do you know at all about that, John, why they blend in some white wine? I mean, I know in Coroti, they, they often put a little bit of Vignet, 5% or so. I'm not aware of other regions taking the white wine in the blend, are you? Uh, I'm happy to, to give you some, some fact, factual evidence here. So in Cote Roti, you can blend up to 20% Viognier. S Hermitage and Crow's Hermitage, you can blend in up to 15% Marsan and Roussan. And in Saint Joseph, you can blend in up to 10% Marsan and Roussan. And for, for my rationale and research and what I've heard people talk about, it's about how it's about adding kind of the exotic aromatics, softening some of the tannins in some vintages, things like that. And I think someone that, that's very much known to do it is Gigal. Right, but he only does like five. No, five percent. But it it's very much makes the signature of some of those La La wines, I think. Yeah. But in Cornos, hundred percent Syrah, no white wines. Right. Right. Um, another question that we got was about. This was some. This is very much to your personal opinion, John. So this is from James. 
In the last few years, appellations like Cornos and San Josef have become very popular, especially around producers like Alamon, Versailles, and Gonon, which we've touched on a little bit here already. Yeah. I don't see the same market enthusiasm for Southern Rhone. Why is that? Pers this is someone's personal opinion. Personally, I find the wines to be rather hot and jammy, exception being Henri Bonneau. Right. Well, I think, uh, you know, Shadowneuf is another one that kind of suffered from, um, you know, it, be it was just like Australia, it became this whole thing with Parker and he, be, he rated all these hugely alcoholic wines, super high scores. And then everybody tried to change their style of making wine that way rather than like the classical way of like the Bocastel, you know, or the Rice, or, you know, even a Bonneau and, and, you know, if you telegraph, don't show, I mean, Chems de Pop in general, the wines are a little bit more alcoholic you know, but there are some that kind of manage that. I mean, the Grenache grape, the warmer climate down south compared to the northern Rome, it is warmer. It is like, you know, I've, I've been there and it's hot. You know, it, it is very hot there in, in, in general uh, all summer long. And it's an arid region. It's hot. It's arid. And the wines are, you know, they're, they're a little more alcoholic and, and you have to like, you know, be willing to make like a, a, you know, trying to make a classic style, a more classic style. And I think everybody chased this kind of Parker Gold. And, uh, you know, a lot of them never came back because, well, they already got the huge scores and that's it. And, and you know, but not everybody likes that style of wine necessarily. I mean, I do love a good Chateau de Pop, but, you know, again, it's tough for me to navigate through that region because I think a lot of the wines are very alcoholic. Someone, someone in the chat said to check out uh, the producer Banneray who uses all 13 grapes in the blend. And I've also agree with Scott, I've had those wines, they're really well balanced. And there's certainly, Chateauneuf isn't always the region that I reach for, but they're still like, like Donjon who you mentioned in Vieux Telegraph. And especially, I, I really like older Beaucastel, which can be a, a tremendous value when you find them at, at auction. Yeah, 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 Banneray, that's a good tip. I am not familiar with that. I'd like, uh, can we get the case tomorrow, Lily? I'd want to try that. You have different wines coming to you tomorrow, but we can work on it for well, Friday. Maybe. Get it in the store at least, you know. yeah. Um, I had a personal question that I wanted to make you talk about. Um, White Roan, I know you've often been a champion of Hermitage Blanc. And I know you're a big fan of the particularly shop, but other uh, white roans. And can we talk a little bit about what you think the benefit of those wines are and why they aren't talked about enough? And also a little bit about Condria and Chateau Grier and things like that that are often forgotten in the conversation of wines from the Northern Rhone. Right. Yeah. Well, I love white wine in general. I drink a lot of white wine at home. I, I tend to you know, often start with a glass of white or two. I just enjoy white wine. And I think, you know, from a drinking standpoint, it's just easier to drink. And, you know, I mean, certainly Hermitage Blanc is the most serious in the shop wines. And, you know, when you, but, you know, some of these wines aren't ready till they're 30, 40 years old sometimes. And then you really like see it. I mean, that's like a different level, you know, but like Condria wines are delicious. Like the peachy apricotty, and there's this oily texture to them and this richness without being heavy, without being like bitey or acidic. You know, I, I love Chondria. I mean, Chondria is a serious appellation. We should do a Chondria, you know, night. Um, you know, white Run Night. White Run Night, we should do that. I like that. We could, we could do that because I love those wines. And the Chondria wines are delicious and they're really like, you know, those are secret wines. Nobody talks about them. Nobody like really like, you know, says, oh, hey, what Condrias do you have? And it, it, it is the, you know, majestic, uh, you know, it's one of the majestic whites of the, of, of, of the Rhone, you know. Everyone is really plugging white Rhone in the chat wow. now. <laughs> Vernet, I, I really like the Vernet Condria as well. I think in terms of a kind of benchmark example, that's certainly up there. People talk a lot about uh, the Gigal, La Dorian, and things like that. But I think there's some less opulent, like outwardly opulent examples that I think really show Viognier well that don't get discussed enough. Yeah, Viognier is a 
delicious grape. That's like a, a, a secret grape still has in Cana. I mean, they're, and they're making some good ones in California, some good Roussins, some good Viognier's, you know, in the Central Coast. I mean, that are just like easy, delicious, tasty wines, you know. Um, Alvin. I, yep, Alvin, and, and uh, th th there's a bunch of them, you know, out there, Coupe and uh, Bonnie Dillon and all those guys, you know. I think uh, Conjure is something that needs more attention for sure. But I mean, maybe it doesn't because, you know, you can get those wines again, you know, it's kind of like Austria, Germany, some of these, you know, you get some of the top producers, you know, 40, 50, $60 a bottle that are like, wow. You know, if they were like in fashion, I mean, they're comparable to some Burgundies or Bordeaux that might be five or six times their price. And, and they deliver that kind of experience, but it just hasn't gotten on the radar yet. I think it's it's a region that really needs more expo exploration and more conversation about it. And I definitely think now we should have a, a, a white your own night. I think now it's in order. Well, summer is coming. Yeah. Does anyone have any other questions? Do you wanna bring anyone live? I know that Chelsea and Mike are, are drinking some of the wines we're having tonight. Can we bring them live for a moment to hear their, their tasting notes? If they'd like to come live, I'd love to bring people live. You know, I, I, I don't want to call on people. You I know. already asked their permission because they said they were drinking the Fourie. So I, I did a pre-screen for you. All right, let's bring them on. Chelsea, hey, and Mike, can you hear us? Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. How are you guys doing? Well, here. thanks. How are you? Yeah, ha Good. happy to be drinking some Rhone, that's for sure. Yeah, it's fun. So you're having the 4E, anything else tonight? We actually, we bought a couple of them. So I'll, I, I'm with John, the Vosges is too, um, it's usually too oaky for me. So we bought the other three. Okay. Um, but we only opened the 4E so far, but it's great. It's fabulous. The have, you still had, the have you had their wines before? Oh, a while ago. I don't, it's, uh, they're not a, a producer we, we're really familiar with. But this this is drinking really well for such a such a good QPR. Yeah. I uh, still get a little bit of the the the, the, the vegetal stemminess, uh, which I kind of like in the northern rooms. Um, I, I think it's uh, I think it's just a just a great a great table wine. Well, we're glad you're drinking along with us, and and glad to have you join us. Yeah, I agree. I'm drink. I mean, I'm going honestly. I'm going back to the four E is the one I'm kind of like. I, I think. I, and you did say that, Lily. I know you said that at five o'clock. You know, I'm gonna. I'll give you your credit. You Thank know. you. I appreciate it, John. But that four E is uh, delicious. I mean, that's like you know. I mean, this is just the wine. It's amazing. That it's only twelve percent alcohol because you don't really see that level of alcohol that much in the room. Well, it's super awesome, Ali. Good job. Cheers. With that. Thanks, Chelsea. Nice to see you guys. Hope you'll join us again soon. Of course. Um, yes, Lily did open her wine three hours ago. Thank you. So did John. It wasn't just me. Um, John, is there any other comments you want to add? You want to extol any other virtues of Northern Rhone Syrah? Uh, I think we covered it pretty well tonight. It was a pretty comprehensive conversation. Thank you for all of your company and uh, questions. And I just want to remind everybody that we are now adding Friday lunch, Friday lunch break, 1230. We will have Jean-Marc Rouleau with us on Friday, 1230 New York time. That's going to be a spectacular event. We have, uh, we're gonna taste through three wines and a liqueur. We're gonna get me liqueured up on Friday afternoon. You know, uh, so I guess I'm gonna cancel all appointments right now for Friday afternoon. Irv, don't call me Friday afternoon because uh, we have, I have a lunch break. I have a lunch date and a lunch break with uh, Jean-Marc Rouleau. It should be very special, a true, you know, real genius, an amazing guy super engaging and uh, really looking forward to that on Friday, 1230. Sign up. Hope to see you guys then. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, see you hopefully on Friday. Thank you, everyone.